Welcome to QIC's conversation series where we call on some of our closest collaborators, all trailblazers within their respective fields, to unpack the forces of change in retail real estate and mixed use development. We're tackling a hot topic question this time around. What should the new workplace ecosystem look like in Australia and how can real estate operators best support companies of different sizes and setups to thrive? For today's conversation, I'm joined by Catherine Ellis, who steered major commercial projects for QIC, such as 80 Collins Street in the Melbourne CBD, Work Club Global's founder, Soren Tampadek, and James Gross from award-winning architectural practice, BVN. Catherine, office accommodation has been a key component of QIC's portfolio for more than 30 years. Can you give us a sense of how that expertise is applied in different CBD and metro settings? Mm. It's interesting. I think our skill sets both in the CBD and in the metro settings balance each other out quite nicely, particularly with CBD towers. It's really about driving efficiency. It's about responding to those core workplace requirements of our tenants. Um, where I think we bring in some of our strength from a retail perspective is weaving that into the, the ground plane and the place experience, the F&B overlay and things like that. The flip side is obviously that we take our CBD workplace experience and all that deep understanding of what makes a really efficient, effective office building tick. We take that out to our um, you know, our metro assets, our town centres. Out in the so, suburbs. Absolutely. Yeah. Those underlying metrics of, you know, buildings that work from a floor plate perspective, great access to daylight, the whole supporting amenity piece, um, all of those fundamentals are what tenants are looking for irrespective of whether they're in the CBD or they're out in Ringwood, yeah, say. So. Absolutely. And Soren, um, you've previously talked about an ecosystem approach to workplace design. Can you take us through some more of the detail of that? When we started eight years ago, that was just a focus on our own club houses and what we did internally in terms of how we were connecting people. Four or five years ago, we thought, what if we apply the same principles to connecting people within entire buildings or precincts? That is what we are experimenting with now, where we look at entire buildings and think, what do we need to do to make sure that we connect people better across the entire asset and create that sense of belonging that you want to be there, not because you have to be there, but you want to be there. And so there's a physical element of that. And then there's the sort of virtual programming events and experiences that we overlay that particular building with to uh, facilitate these connections. We really want to see how do we create in partnership with landlords uh, buildings that are smart, not just from an operational perspective, but also from a people perspective and hand in hand, create destinations where you want to be. And it's not a nine to five. It's looking at everything from the very beginning of the day all the way through to late night. Yeah, makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Um, James, from, I guess, uh, your wonderful architectural perspective, how's the blurring of professional life with leisure time and an increased health awareness impacting workplace design kind of flowing on from what Soren's talking about? We have to reinvent those buildings and, and think of them, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, but it's a good um, analogy or metaphor, and that is that, that a, think of a building as a village. One of the aspirations is to take the the horizontality of the ground plane or the public realm and and sort of weave it up into into mm. the building. No longer do we think of a stack of pancakes. Those lawyers will take level 13 mm. to 17. We've got to think, as, as Soren says, the building is a complete e ecosystem and you can't hive it off anymore. We've got one of our Cross River Rail developments at the moment and it is a CBD tower on a very small site. So how do we start to create that sense of place? We can mm. only do it Vertically, vertically yeah. at the moment, the first eight or nine floors are given over to mixed use and mm. amenity. And I think our challenge and, you know, working with our investment team and, and things will be how we commercialise that space, which is a mindset change right throughout the industry, right? Through the as well, world. Because this is equally as applicable for our mixed use um, town centre buildings as much as it is for our CBD buildings. Mm. The underpinning of the structure it needs to work for a multitude of uses through the, the life of the building. You have to look at it holistically mm. to mm. really manage that experience. Mm. 
um, and have sensitivity to all the different people that you want to attract and, and even the wider community, mm. how do you bring them in? Mm. If you do that, I think you, you set yourself apart from 99% of what's out there. And, and I think the other thing you have to think about when, when we think about these things is time. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, it gets dark and traditionally commercial buildings go dark. Mm. So a question is how do you make them come to life after yeah. dark as well? And um, and so you can, you know, there's those things of putting um, agricultural urban farms, mm. you can farm vertically on the face of buildings. So you can do all sorts of things that, you know, you can have bees on top of the building. <laughs> so you can make uh, buildings uh, more accessible over the 24-hour period rather than thinking, thinking of them this simply as assets. It's certainly a shift in the commerciality of things, I think. We're developing these office buildings that have all of the surrounding amenity already mm. there, right on the doorstep. I mean, great pop public transport connections, but then you've got the the entertainment, you've got the food and beverage, and it's that transition from just an asset into something that is a, a place. We're a large investment house, QIC, but all the things we're just talking about actually adds value to mm, building exactly. if you do it yeah. correctly. Yeah. People want to be there, higher rents, higher retention. Mm. You're setting yourself apart from yeah, the building absolutely. next door or buildings next door. So it's, it's, it makes total financial sense, but it does mean that you may need to think of some spaces in a different way. Mm. Also, what are amenities? What are, what are public? Yeah. What are for tenants? What are... You know, those boundaries. It truly is a disruption of the space. Yeah. yeah. Right? You, it's yeah. non-traditional thinking mm. yeah. in how you're going. And I think a really balanced approach to, you know, I think when you're developing the mixed use strategy and looking at the at, at the different sort of usages within the buildings, it's, it may not be about, you know, this is 100% the best thing for office or mm. 100% the best thing for retail. It's getting that balance and it's that broader economic value of all the bits knitting together and complementing each other rather than just solely being focused on on office or retail. We have to have buildings that are about where we live mm. and embrace <clears throat> not just in, environmental things and climatic things, but, but social things and uh, cultural things of mm. that place. So I think... And the know, users and the area and the community mm. around and everything, and that's... Forget who's leasing what, mm. but just in terms of solutions, what goes where and why does it go there? And it's, it's, yeah. it's unique for every site. And that's just the hardware part. The curation of experiences and events comes later. What Australia uh, sells to the world uh, is quite a specialised in sort of mm. boutique idea about work and place. And I think that those things foster really interesting um, new directions. So, and I might come back to you, based on the feedback for your members um, and, and that feedback that they're giving you, and broader shifts in the business world, this is quite a broad question, can you give us an insight at all into what's next for Work Club? The next one in the works is, mm. is the QIC, yes. the next oh, stage in, in Canberra where mm. it will be a precinct-wide application. Mm. But for all the fleet, it meant that we talk about 6,000 square metres of space and it's a mixture of um, traditional workspace in the top of the tower, different kind of bars, uh, cafe, retail, a restaurant, ground level, lower ground, conference events, us running the front of house concierge services and having all these pieces of this puzzle that we call connected human ecosystem that uh, we would not be interested in those on their own. You know, we wouldn't want to do a cafe on its own. Mm. We wouldn't want to do yeah. a restaurant on its own. They all make sense as an ecosystem and how they support each other and how all of that frontline team members are important facilitators in this ecosystem mm. where they need to get to know who you are and how we connect you with someone else and connect everybody across the asset mm. as well as visitors coming into the asset. Your approach to the next phase in Canberra has been, I, th I think, one of the most progressive in mm. Australia, which is why I really enjoyed working on it, is it's precinct-wide mm. approach. And you got you got a hotel, you got residential, you got offices, you got retail, you got pretty much everything. James, just picking up on Soren's comments around the well-being space, um, would you mind just taking us through uh, the Castle Towers commercial office development that you're working on with us and, and how, how well-being has really been incorporated into that uh, design? In well-being, there's, there's not, the, you know, there's physio physiological things and there's psychological things. So that from a physiological point of view, 
uh, we know because we've been working in these sort of buildings for a long time, people want to get outside uh, in a building. And so uh, at, in your building at Castle Towers, we have, uh, and I think this will be the first, although it's there's lots of buildings over the last 50 years in mm. Australia that have got little sort of pokey little balconies on the 50th floor where, you know, if you're not careful, you'll get swept off and land mm. in Antarctica. <laughs> so we, we, did a, we did a project uh, in Sydney for a residential tower and typically you can't get out on a balcony over about the 20th floor. In this building, you can go out on the 70th floor and you're protected from wind. It's still in the outside. So we started to think if you can achieve that in a, in a residential building in the middle of Sydney, how come you can't do it in an office building? So we've now got a, a veranda on this building on all floors facing north. There's no balustrades because there's a very fine mesh holding you back from falling off. So the experience <laughs> is not just like being on some balcony in a, bit, in a building, but being seamless with the outside. It's part of the shift in this commercial equation again. If you supply this amount of um, returnable F, uh, uh, NLA, mm. then actually you get this little bit for mm. something far less, but it's actually where people want to be. So that's one thing, and that's about breathing fresh air. And it's about, about being able to stand or sit in the sunlight and work. And then there is the act of walking. You know, we've all got our 10,000 steps. In some buildings, you can take the lift and you go straight up to the middle of the building and that's where you arrive. Mm. And then you walk up and down from the middle as opposed to enter at the bottom and go up. You know, so there's different ways of thinking about that, which mean that you walk everywhere. In a project we did in New Zealand, it's a very complex but beautiful stair and people love it. And not only that, we've designed it so the sun shines on it. So the idea of well-being is also a psychological one where you can walk. You've got to go to the toilet, you walk down this beautiful stair, the sun shines on you and all of a sudden going to the toilet is not the mechanical thing it used to be. It's this sort of lovely experience of, of enjoying the natural world as much as you can inside yeah. the building. Yeah. But it's the efficiency of the building and it's also the attraction for tenants and their employees. Oh, absolutely. You know, we know that from our work that um, four to six stories, people still feel connected um, viscerally in mm. six stories of, of a volume, in other words, an atrium or whatever, they can still feel part of a community. Yeah. They are about scale, human scale. Yeah. So, you know, when you talk about town centres, somehow you have to dismantle the idea that that development is about big, it's mm. more about quality and you can spread it out and you'll get more return and ultimately because it's, it's, it's they're better places. James, I, th I just got back from Denmark. I was on level six of a building and I had complete outlook over the whole city yeah. and it felt it felt different you know the whole it's not a small city it's still a, a big city with a, all these small streets and lots of different things you can explore but it just it, it felt different and i think this is a whole often we don't talk about the feeling mm. you know how does it actually yeah. feel no I, well, mm. a lesson i learned about about what people think is good good design is some years ago we designed a building and i thought it was fantastic and had all whiz bangs and things and <laughs> nobody said how good it looked they all huh? said how good it felt yeah <laughs> but actually i realized that that it was a bigger compliment it was a much bigger compliment mm. because it was they were reacting to it in a sort of visceral human way. So we always use, again, this sort of cliche of designing from the inside out. So when you design what has to happen inside a building, and then the facade is as a result of the necessity for function inside. Mm. The facade operates uh, because of what's happening inside the building, not because of the way someone wants the building to look. Mm. So it's a different, it's a reversing of priorities. It's there we must unfortunately pause the conversation for now. So with sincere thanks for Catherine, Soren and James for sharing their passion and expertise. If you'd like to join in the conversation or have thoughts on a topic we should tackle in our next series, please get in touch via LinkedIn or our website. Until next time, thanks for watching.